my leg is 84 years old. Sometimes the goes step up and says, who, me? <laughs> you notice they changed the lectern here so that you'd know there's somebody behind there talking. <laughs> I am so thankful to be invited to this preaching rally again and thank God for the permission to come yet another time and I hope he will enable me to communicate with all of you. I'm so glad to see so many young people here. I know a number of churches in this area in the last 60 years have preached around here somewhat, especially at the Lake Region Christian Assembly, and I expect to see more adults at our gathering this year up here in this area, but I'm pleased to see so many children, and I hope that you'll be able to to hear my sentences and see some of the pictures and, and be with us. I want to tell you, our Lord is good. And he is real. And he made us to be his children, to be like him, to exhibit himself, extend himself, and have someone to love, have us really live in love with him. And it grieves him that the human race is so far estranged from him in unbelief, in humanism, in our own pride. But he made us to have a will, and he has to get our attention, he has to get our faith, our trust, he has to get our love, he has to get our cooperation to be remade, recreated. The first creation, the illimitable universe that he made, he made with a word in a day, and he put everything on it in six days. But to make creatures like himself, spiritual creations that are really not forced and molded by hand, but that are really his nature. That takes longer. He's still working at it. That has cost him immensely. And you are the object of his affections. It's not easy for us to feel the reality of his great love for us. In his wisdom and his goodness and love, he has given us promises that help us to think of his importance for our lives and help us to have different feelings about many things, help us not to be in the lost human race, but to be in the renewed company, created again in his image filled with his spirit. If indeed we will believe him. I want to read to you first from 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5, or 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge, or this version, the New American Standard says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. And that can be translated to his own glory and virtue. And it's hard to tell which he really has in mind. But I think it's his own glory and virtue that means when he says, and by these also he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Or as the King James says, his precious and exceeding great promises. So that you may become partakers of his divine nature. We read over that phrase, what do you think he said? That we may be partakers of his divine nature. Having escaped from the corruption that is in this world through lust. Or in the world by lust in America. And some say by evil desire. I think that's the New International. And the Revised Standard Version just say by passions, by the passions of this world. Well, now we all have that. And Brother Gibbon talking this morning about Elijah, man, like passions with us. We have all been partakers of that human nature. We've all had our own desires, we've gone our own way. And the scripture often says, like we, like sheep of all, go turned aside, each one to his own way. And you young people, like sheep, sheep flock together. We get the word gregarious from the flock of the sheep. Um, young people want to be different, all alike. <laughs> Everything about life and godliness is given to us through the knowledge of him. Amen. Now, most versions don't say true knowledge because... In the original, there's no word for true, but it's suggested by the prefix ap on the word gnos gnosis, knowledge. And I think it's often used without any 
serious intent for distinction between gnosis and epignosis. But here, the translators of the New American Standard probably rightly thought that Peter intended to mean a genuine knowledge and a real consciousness of Jesus Christ. Not the superficial hearing about him without any comprehension and, and conviction. How can you hear about Jesus and say you know him without convictions, without submission, without some comprehension? And that's why rallies like this help a good deal for many of us. I've been edified by meditating on these things. We're going to talk about looking for Jesus coming. It's just a promise to us now. We have a certainty about it, well discussed yesterday, in the matter of the fact of his coming. But we're not taking it seriously. Peter certainly is not saying true knowledge as opposed to false knowledge. That would take an adjective. This is just a prefix on, on the word knowing that implies that it's got to be a genuine knowledge of Jesus. Amen. Not just a Sunday school remembrance of some stories about Jesus. Christianity is the gospel and the application of the gospel to us. Christianity is Christ. It is the reality of first his life as a son of God and Messiah. Messiah the Christ of God is God's agent in all dealings with mankind. In the creation, in the redemption, in the recreation. Um, and when you ask people to confess faith in Christ, don't just ask me to believe Jesus is the son of God. The scripture confession is he is the Christ, the son of God. We must also be impressed with the reality of his death as a sacrifice and redemption for sinners. And the proclamation of his resurrection as the conqueror of sin and death. This is knowing something about Jesus. We need to know about him at least his life as the son of God, his death as the redeemer, and his resurrection as the remaker and ruler of the whole new race in the new covenant in the renewing of things. I'm glad you already heard, hope you all did, the sermon on the passing away of the natural order because people don't realize we aren't just uh, sufficient human beings helped by the knowledge of God and morality and family values as the world likes to call it. We are a wreck that needs to be rebuilt. Some weeks ago I noticed in the paper that Gibbon's van was stolen in Joplin. This morning I asked him, did he ever recover it? He said they found it way down in Louisiana and they are rebuilding it. And he mentioned some of the things they had to rebuild and he has to go after it and then he'll find out if they succeed in rebuilding it. You are part of the wreckage of God's creation that went wrong. And God wants to remake you and rebuild you, restore you. And his grace is such that not only wants to avoid the punishment of guilt. He wants to give to us the uh, blessings and the awards of, of righteousness. He wants to, his grace is the opposite of justice. It's not just the absence of justice, the opposite of justice. I see in Paul and Onesimus and Philemon a kind of a parable here. Onesimus was the slave of Philemon in Colossae in Asia Minor. He ran away from home. He got to Rome. Somehow he got in touch with the Apostle Paul was, who was in his own hired house as a prisoner with a constant Roman guard. Paul converted him to Christ and then sent him back home to yield himself up to his master from whom he left. He sent that wonderful little letter, the letter to Philemon, which you can read right before Hebrews and after Titus in your New Testament. And he expected Philemon not only not to kill his slave who ran away, not to punish him severely, but to receive him as a beloved son. And Paul says, I'll not remind you that you owe your life to me. <laughs> Paul says, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. Jesus takes all our obligations, bore them all to God, and gives us all things that pertain to life and to godliness through knowing him and believing him and accepting him. 
but it's personal. There's no Christianity without Christ, very important person, the Lord, the Revealer, the Redeemer, the Renewer. There's no Christianity without the cross. He could not do without the cross. In Gethsemane, it was a terrible burden. Almost unto death, he sought to pray even to the Father. If there's a plan B, let's use it. If there's any other way, deliver me from this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was no other way. There's no way to redeem the lost life of man because of sin, except by the life of the Son of God in sacrifice. And once he died, the law was fulfilled. That's the fulfillment of the law. Matthew 5, 17 is mistranslated, misunderstood, almost more than any other verse in the New Testament. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And people translated, I came not to abolish. He did abolish the law. Ephesians 2 says he abolished the law. Hebrews says he set it aside. Romans 7 says he made you dead to it. He discharged you from the law. He took the law entirely out of the way because he fulfilled it. Colossians 2, 14. He nailed it to the cross. Leroy Garrett wouldn't even believe me when I sent him my essay on law or grace, that Christianity is the end of the law. And Romans 10 mentions that the end of the law, but it's, that could be the object of the law. Well, Jesus completed, completely fulfilled the law. There I tried to illustrate uh, and this, in May I was out in Bozeman, Montana lecturing and apple blossoms were interesting to see on young apple trees out there. And that illustrates to me the way the law is fulfilled by the gospel. The apple blossoms, if they were plucked and preserved, would be destroyed. But when they're replaced by the apple, they're abolished and fulfilled. Amen. Jesus did not need to preserve or to embellish, or to enhance, or to revise the law at all. He came to replace the law with an entirely different system of morality, a system of associate, personal association and relationship with him, of love, as Paul said in Galatians 5 about this, if you accept circumcision as a requirement, then you're bound to keep the whole law. If you keep the law, then you've fallen away from grace. Christ has become none effect to you. We, by the promise of God, wait for the hope of righteousness. Amen. If we live by faith working through love, Christianity works by faith working through love, by the indwelling of Christ's Holy Spirit, by the change of your desires, Amen. not by any improvement on the commandments. Only we have better than the commandments, we have Christ personally, and examples like Paul and so forth that teach us the will of God. <clears throat> in his grace and truth, God's power and authority in the new covenant and the making of the new creation. This is the gospel. His, the message is a revelation of God and a presentation of the word of life, the creating power of God given to make us know and trust him and then to change us, to fill our hearts with his truth and to give us the renewing presence of his own spirit within us. Amen. <clears throat> Ennis Dowling, who uh, was some years dean of the graduate school at Lincoln and may have been known for some of his great career as a scholar among us, was lecturing here at Cedar Lake on Ephesians. And he told us that one August day when he was a young man on the farm, they took some prize pigs to the county fair and when he was in high school, and it was his job to get the pig ready for the show ring, and uh, he scrubbed the pig and polished its toenails and curled its tail. I always thought that was an embellishment. Some say they really do that. And he was chasing this pig from where he had his, his dressing room or farm, a uh, barn to take care of it, to the show ring, and that pig found a mud puddle and got down and wallowed in it. He had to chase it back and clean it all up again and chase it around the mud puddle and get it to the show ring. And he was hot from the labor and hot under the collar. He got the blue ribbon. So he went home that evening to the family farm and he saw on the doorstep 
farm cat sitting there washing himself. He got a real inspiration. If I could just take the spirit of the cat and put it in the pig, I'd have it me. Now that's a high school boy's bright idea. God had the same idea. When he saw the mess of the human race, if I just put the spirit of Jesus in them all, what a wonderful change it would make. That's what it's all about. You are a pig that need the spirit of the cat. <laughs> Christianity is our faith, not in the church and its programming and its group dynamics, but in action in the real and vital attachment of our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. He is the vine. He makes us branches through which he can bear his fruit. Now, we're not just attached so that we have to bear fruit for him, our fruit, no. We need to be attached so that he is bearing his fruit in us. Amen. We're simply his learners, his followers, his disciples, and the vessels to receive his truth, his grace, his life. But he has more for us than we ever imagined. Amen. When we ask for the Lord for information, he gives us more than we ever want to know. <laughs> when we ask him for reformation, he has more new standards and ways than we ever wanted. By his promises, when we really receive them and believe them, we're turned around, we're set right with reality, we're made over in God's likeness. The corruption in the world, which Peter says we escape, includes all the sinful thoughts and practices which come from the unbelieving ignorance and desires of human nature. This, that is the foolish and fickle and conflicting desires that make up human nature. When people were found, oh, a very irritable, angry type, well, that's just my nature. Brother Strong used to say, blaming your sins on your nature doesn't change the nature of your sins. The fact is, we are of sinful nature. That's why many people think that we all have the sin of Adam in our very being. Well, we're not found guilty of Adam's sin before we're born, but we are found of the nature of Adam and the sinful human nature is it's mine I'll do it my way I I I want Jesus has to cure the deadly cancer of self the greatest competitor of God is self he cures the deadly cancer of self in three degrees that I saw in an old paper about 1955 the uh, expository times from Scotland some preacher summarized it this way. Self-rule, that is self-will, the desire to avoid obedience. Now, how many of you ever tried to evade obedience? Uh, no honest people here. <laughs> the Adonis got me a lantern. How many of you ever tried to avoid obedience? Haven't we all? When my oldest sister was 18, she thought she didn't have to obey mama just right, and she got a spanking on her 18th birthday, and that made me bug eyed. You know. We want the time when we don't have to mind anybody, don't have to do what somebody else says. Women of this country think they are great and progressive when they won't obey any man, when they won't let their wedding ceremony say, love, honor, and obey. God expects children to obey their parents, he expects wives to obey their husbands, he expects husbands to obey the impulse of love to even to the point of death for their family, their wife, he expects us all to obey Christ. And the gospel is unto the obedience of faith among all the nations. Paul says at the beginning of Romans, at the end of Romans, people think that Romans is a message of faith only, it's a message of faith that obeys. And James says the same thing, faith that doesn't act isn't faith at all. It's dead. God wants to save us from the deadly cancer of self-rule. Second, self-interest. Self-interest is the desire to avoid all sacrifice. I don't want to give it up, you know, it's mine. I've had 10 children, 28 grandchildren, 21 just last week, great-grandchildren, they're great grandchildren. My youngest daughter is a pediatrician in Rogers, Arkansas. I told her, you are trying to show in demonstration the perfect baby and the ideal children. Her two boys are a delight. And uh, 
I told her, I named her Joy. You know, I told her one time a few years ago, you're not only a joy, you're a delight. She's the, been the most like her oldest sister, while some of you know, Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca will be 60 in December, and she's always been so easy to deal with. She's so eager to do right and uh, on initiative to, to do well. I'd just like to tell you some stories about her, but uh, some others are not so easy. And I've seen these times, the finest little children we have will have this desire to avoid sacrificing anything. Uh, we were talking at the breakfast table about losing things in this world, and I said we wouldn't have missed them if we'd never had them. Once we had them, we have a sense of loss, and we resent that. The Apostle Paul had imbibed the spirit of Jesus so deeply that he could say, I'm telling you the truth. God knows I'm telling you the truth. I could wish my own soul to be anathema from Christ for their sake, my kinsmen according to the flesh, that they might be saved. Now, if you've never wished to be lost in order somebody else to be saved, you don't know what he's talking about. Jesus did exactly that. He was on the throne of heaven. He was in with God in everything. We can't even conceive of the infinite greatness and graciousness and wonderfulness of Jesus and he wanted to leave heaven now we don't know that he had the name Jesus then of course he didn't he wasn't the son of God then he was God and he wanted to leave heaven and sacrifice himself as guilty of all the sins of the world in order that he might save us give us not only his death to redeem us but his life to live in us if we are reconciled unto God when we were enemies by his death, how much more shall we be saved by his life? Romans 5 talks about it. It's our union with him that is our salvation. It's not just a business deal between him and God. It's our union with him that is. Hebrews, I mean Ephesians 4.22 calls these lusts that we're to escape, the lusts of deceit. I don't like the New International Version saying deceitful lust because he's talking about lust of deceit as opposed to putting on the righteousness and holiness of truth. Now there's a great deal of difference in your life between truth and accepting deceitful substitutes for the truth. A great deal of difference. Always choose the truth. Always refuse the false, the lie. Everyone that loves and makes a lie goes into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21, 8, and Revelation 22, what is it, 16, somewhere like that. They say this very plainly. And one of the prevalent things in this society, at home and at business, at school, is cheating and deceiving and lying. All men are liars. Generally speaking, you can pretty well say that. If you become a lover of the truth, that will help you to follow. If you love somebody else, not yourself, but you have a spirit of sacrificial love, then you are of God. God is love. God wants to save us from that self-centered desire to avoid all sacrifice for somebody else. Now, the third one's a little harder to get, and I hope you really do. He saves us from the deadly cancer of self-complacency. That is, that we're satisfied with ourselves and getting we think gets saved and we don't care about others. It's a matter of being uh, satisfied just to get our breakfast and don't care if anything's left for anybody else. Or we get our uh, a place in the grace of God and, and we're not really putting ourselves out to take care of everybody else who stumbles along the way. The demands of fellowship mean that you teach and admonish one another. The demands of fellowship mean that you accept the burden of other people's needs that you not only provide physically, but spiritually and emotionally. Fellowship, God made us to see something of it in the family where we have the real uh, unit of discipleship and so forth. We work for and of one another. What's the Lord trying to do? He has to change our desires. They're changed by faith in his love and goodness and changed especially by the gift of the Spirit to live in us. Our desires are also redirected by the predictions and the promises. And that's what we're talking about here, the promises. Looking for him 
because we believe his promise is an important part, an essential part. We think of hope just at funerals and at death and things like that. It sounds like hope was a knot at the end of your rope to hang on to. No, hope is both desire and expectation Amen. of things you have as a goal all your life. Amen. You need to live by hope. Our desires are redirected by predictions and promises which he has given us if we believe them. Perhaps we need to pray the prayer a friend of mine prayed over 50 years ago when he was coming back after the Second World War, back to try to become a real Christian. He promised God he would see him through the war. And he said he'd wake up sometime in the middle of the night, slip out of bed, out into the kitchen, and down on the floor and pray, Lord, I know it's true. Help me to believe it. Yes. Now, that's an intelligent prayer. Amen. You know it's true, but do you really believe it? Live by the faith? The great William E. Hawking of Harvard University wrote a long time ago, the changing of human nature is the changing of desires. Have you ever been converted? If you're converted, if you belong to Christ, if you're a new creature, then you have different desires than those you had before. Amen. There used to be people you wanted to take it to before and block their knock off. Now, you may have mercy on those people and you want to help and you want to work on the unfortunate bad mood in which they did the wrong thing. You're not just trying to get even. You're trying to get him to change his attitude. We need to change our desires. Isn't that clear? But it's not easy. We like what we like to be. And we like to be like we are. And we don't easily give up liking the things we like. <laughs> Do we? Two worlds compete for our attention and for our interests. Amen. The present world of self-service and the spiritual world of Christ's kingdom where you serve Christ and not self. Amen. Even preachers need to learn 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Amen. We need to see the difference. Somebody wrote a remarkable poem that I never see anybody pay much attention to. I've tried to furnish music for it, but I haven't been successful. Let me hold lightly temporal things, I mean things of the earth, transient treasures, what are they worth? Moth can corrupt them, rust can decay, all their bright beauty fades in a day. Let me hold lightly temporal things, I who am deathless, I who have wings. Let me hold fast, Lord, things of the skies, quicken my vision, open my eyes, Show me thy beauty, glory, and grace, endless as time is, boundless as space. Let me hold lightly things that are mine. Lord, thou hast given me all that is thine. Amen. And when you are an heir of all that belongs to Christ, you don't have to be chintzy with people about the use of your lawnmower. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul said, we look not upon the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. Somebody quoted this yesterday. For the things that are seen are temporal. I wondered if the kids understood uh, Brother Charles Gresham and the very clear sentences he used, but words you don't use every day. Is temporal a word you use? Temporal means just of the present time and that's all. There's a good old Greek word or derivative from Greek, ephemeral, just lasting a day. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. Now what do you look at? What are you looking out for? The changing of human nature is the changing of desires. We call that repentance. We call it conversion. Don DeWelt, as a young man, was trying to propagate this by writing a little tract on repentance. And then he spelled it on the outside with four E's. Repentance has three E's and one A. And I said the way to spell repentance is four L's. A change of what you look at a change of what you like, a change of whom you love, and a change of the way you live. Look like, love, and live are four easy words to learn. Remember, they are the essence of repentance. Looking for Jesus. What are you looking for? What do you look up to? What do you look down on? What do you look out for or you're afraid of? What do you look around at for temptation? Um, 
The change of look, I'd like to dwell on that a little bit more. The change of like, what do you like? Have you ever changed from liking only pie to liking broccoli? Some things good for you? Huh? Whom you love, that makes a difference. We used to have a little old song. Whom, who's your little hoosus? Who are you thinking of? Who's your little hoosus? Whom do you love? Makes a lot of difference. Some people, I love me. I'm just the grandest thing I know. I protect myself from everybody's slight or implication of this faith. The most important thing in the world is whom you love. As dean of a college, I seriously said this to what we lead you to love is far more important than what we make you learn. Amen. If you learn all, well, Joseph Stalin memorized the four Gospels, I hear. And he was one of the world's worst brutes. Wasn't any good for anybody I, I know of. It's an ill wind that blows nobody good. Some of you play instruments, I always like this. An oboe is a wood, uh, an ill wind that nobody blows good. <laughs> well, let's get back to this. Are you looking only at the things that are seen? The things that are seen impress themselves upon us. They seem so important. They seem so necessary. They take our time and our labor, our efforts. It's the things that are not seen that are real. And you have to do that by faith, taking God at his word. You were talking about music some of you. There was a famous, great bass singer named Jerome Kern who made a record of the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't mean the parable of the prodigal son. And on the record he had the song of the blind plowman. I don't ever know of it otherwise. And I took this record on tape to class one day to play and played also the song of the blind plowman. The key phrase in that is, thanks to God who took away my eyes that my soul might see. In that class was Ned Benedict from Ohio, young man who from multiple sclerosis was blinded and then came to college. And his wife helped him and he studied diligently with tapes and with her reading to him and with his, everything he could and he graduated. He wanted to take Greek. I told him it wouldn't be the use, Ned, in your laboring to get somebody, if you can't see the Greek New Testament, uh, you would be spending an awful lot of time for something you couldn't use. And I discouraged him. Uh, only person I ever discouraged him taking Greek, Charles. <laughs> I guess. Did God do you a favor when he cut you off from some of the entrancing and enticing things of this world? Yes, yes indeed. Thou that took away my eyes that my soul might see. Fanny Crosby became a great hymn writer because she was blind. She could see things that people with eyes couldn't see. Yeah. For the eternal things are not seen with eyes. Amen. How do you look today? I don't mean how do you appear when I look at you. I mean how are you looking? The famous Johnson that wrote the first English dictionary was sitting at a dinner one day. That was before the days of good deodorants and and everybody having a shower and so forth. Uh, bathtubs were not invented yet, I think. And the lady, fastidious lady said, you smell. He said, no, I'm sure you're wrong. It's you that are smelling, I stink. <laughs> and that's all right. As a, as a lifelong student of language, I appreciate that. Now, when I say, how do you look? You think of me, how do I appear to people? That isn't important. What's important is what are you looking at? What are you looking out for? What are you looking up to? Amen. That's what we're talking about. Looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you looking to the end of this age when he comes to institute an entirely new order of things? Now we can't prove that he's coming in any way except to take his word for it. Amen. And Charles is so right. It's not a matter of fact yet. Fact is from Latin meaning things done. If it hasn't been done, it isn't a fact, even if it's a truth. If you want to get to really sharpen your distinctions. But it is true. It is reliable. It is reality in you to look for his coming. We can be sure of his coming. Now, other messages in this group will dwell on that. And 
I just want to remind you, he said to his favorite friends at the Last Supper, among the last words when he loved them to the uttermost, if I go um, to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then after that talk, in the end of the 17th chapter of John, where he was praying for us all, I'm just so impressed by the fact that he was praying to the Father that he might be able to show us the glory of the Father and the love that the Father had with him before the world was. Let me read you these words at the close of his prayer. Oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. These know that thou hast sent me. I have made known to them your name. I will make it known and the love which you have had for me, may, that it may be in them and I in them. I guess I missed the verse before. I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to behold my glory, the glory which you have given me before the foundation of the world. Amen. Yes, he wants me to see that, to be there. Acts 1 11, this Jesus whom you see going into heaven will so come in like manner as now you hold him going. 1 Thessalonians 4 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Under oath in court on trial for his life, Jesus said, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, there are many, many other passages. He said, and his apostles and prophets said at least hundreds of times in the New Testament, it's a fact, he's coming. It's certain. I hope you get that this week. It's also going to be sudden. It's going to, the time is uncertain and there are no signs. Preachers try to make people think they have a lot of truth when they, they try to turn the signs of the fall of Jerusalem into signs of the coming of Christ and they distort the scriptures pretty badly. The scripture teaches there are no no signs, no omens, no forecasts of the time of his coming. Always says, in a time when they think not, in an hour when they know not, sudden destruction comes upon them and that without deliverance or relief. He wants us to know that he's coming. He wants us not to know when because he wants it always to be imminent and all of us to have the same expectation and the same desire and nothing to interfere with the expectancy today Amen. Amen. but it will be a time of serious consequences and there's one reason you look forward to it some of you look forward to the glory of his coming some of you look forward to the, maybe the glory of his angels you look forward to the the streets of gold and i don't know whether gold makes good paving material or not but um, regardless of what the pictures of revelation may be i think they can't be very literal i find it hard to believe in a city that has uh, his apartment's 1,600 miles tall as well as 600 miles long and 600 miles wide, and uh, God is the light of all of it. And, uh, you know, this thing's kind of hard to visualize there or to plan buildings like that. But there'll be the dis dissolution of this material universe. There'll be the judgment upon all men. There'll be the entering into the joys of the Lord and salvation for those who eagerly wait for him to be his reign of absolute sovereignty in heaven and in earth, the end of the power and the rulers of this world, the end of power and the reign of death, Christ being glorified in his saints, marveled at by all who believe, his bringing light to those things that are hidden in the darkness. He will, we shall all be changed, gathered to the Lord, to be the resurrection of all the saints, the man of sin will be destroyed, and so forth. Back here on the table, there, there are a few pages, eight small pages out of the commentary on Thessalonians by Wilbur Fields, thinking through Thessalonians. I, used, I had a few and you picked those up, so Brother Dave had more copied in there on the table back there. But it's one page, what will happen when he comes? There's 17 things like that. I don't want to take more of your time on that. You can pick that up. But we're not looking for the wonderful things that come with Jesus. We're looking for Jesus. Amen. That we may be in him and he in us. Amen. Why the Lord wants us to know the future. He wants us to be warned of crises we're going to meet. 
so that we will not be uh, discouraged or think he didn't mean it or it was all a false faith or something like that. He wants us to understand the nature of our salvation and to know that this world is neither our hope nor our home. Amen. He wants us to look forward with hope and longing to his coming in glory and to our perfect union with him whom we love. He wants us to realize that he himself is our destiny and our exceeding great reward. Amen. He wants us to, be, to have assurance and comfort in the afflictions and the sorrows of life. He would have us all to be as strong and as steadfast as Paul the Apostle by having his kind of faith in the far more exceeding weight of eternal glory, by looking not at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we quote some of that and following, but look at Romans 8. This is a great passage. In the great Roman letter about the doctrine of salvation, it says we are saved by hope. We're saved in hope. We're saved through hope. And without hope, if you don't have hopes enough to have longings and expectations of Christ, you don't have faith enough to be saved, perhaps. Right. God's the judge of that. The beginning of the 18th verse of Romans 8, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not fit to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, some say vanity, not willingly, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, yet in hope Amen. that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption, to decay, to rotting out, set free unto the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Not only this, but we ourselves, who have already the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. I used to have strong legs. I nearly lived on a bicycle four years. I used to love ice skating, and hockey, and things like that. Now my legs give me trouble. You probably saw I wobbled coming up the steps. I had to help that knee. Um, I said to one day last year, one of my legs is 83 years old. And he said, how old is the other one? And then he told me, he said, a doctor told a friend of mine that what was troubling his leg was just old age. He said, I know that's wrong because the other is just old as that one. <laughs> that's not the whole reason, is it? <laughs> now look, we long for the renewal of our vigor and strength. I've got jobs I want to do at home, on my house, on my car, on the truck, <laughs> that uh, are a real trial to my present body. Well, are you looking forward not only to what you're going to get out of it, but what are you going to be for him? We're looking forward to the marriage of the king's son. Are you preparing to adorn yourself, to be pleasing to him, to be a glory to him? Look at this prayer in Ephesians 1, about the beginning of the 16th verse. Paul says, uh, I pray that his divine power will grant unto you that you may be, your eyes, your heart may be enlightened and you may be able to, this, uh, Ephesians 1, 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened that you may know three things, the hope of his calling. That you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Amen. Now a lot of people think about his inheritance for me. No, it's my being an inheritance for him. Amen. In fact, in that same chapter in the, the 11th verse, I think the modern translations are wrong. The, the old American Standard Version had it right. Also, we have become, we've been made an inheritance for him. We've been made a heritage for him. The Greek word is just plain as the nose on your face. Every feature about that formation, that word, we have been made a heritage for him. And Paul talked about we Jews. Then you Gentiles, having heard the, heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you have been stamped with the Holy Spirit, which is the in earnest of your inheritance. We keep him about our inheritance. We want to be something for him. 
If you were the uh, young woman preparing to be the bride of the prince or some, the greatest man you know, and you're waiting for that day of the marriage, you're doing something to make yourself pleasing to him. If you really believe that Jesus is coming for you, you prepare yourself to be a glory to him. He wants us to have a daily consciousness, true knowledge of him and his coming. Consciousness of the imminent return of Christ will surely prompt more godly living, more sacrificial giving, more patience and rejoicing in the times of trial. Paul said, we not only rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, we rejoice in tribulations because those tribulations increase our hope. And that hope will never put us to shame, we know, because already the love of God has been shed abroad into our hearts. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. The word of the Holy Spirit is love. If you have changed from hating to loving, you're already seeing that the gospel works. Amen. That the power of God is in it. That life is genuine in the gospel. We need to realize that we do all our works under his watchful eye. And we shall soon stand before him to give account. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning about the 6th to the 8th verse, the Apostle Paul says, uh, We make it our aim and ambition to be well-pleasing unto him, because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Amen. I shorten that, leaving out a few words. The heart of Christianity is the vital power of faith, hope, and love, all centered upon Jesus Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Amen. Anyone who does not believe his word enough to hope for his coming, to love his appearing, will surely lack the personal force of Christ in his life. Amen. The predictions of his coming should be, even to the unbeliever, an inducement to heed more seriously Christ's commands and claims and to become an obedient believer to Christ. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. You've been good listeners, maybe that's long enough. I don't see any clock. Um, he wants us to know some things about the future. Paul prayed these prayers like this we just read in Ephesians. Hope is both desire and expectation. Desire without expectation is a forlorn uh, failure. Expectation without desire is a threat and something to fear. In uh, the parables of the, of the soils, the sower, Jesus said one good kind of soil was sown with good seed, but the weeds, the thorns, grew up and choked out the, seed, the good seed. And when he explained it, especially as in Mark 4, 18 and 19. Others are the ones upon whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke out the word and becomes unfruitful. Now Paul wrote in Philippians 3 about this kind of failure. This is the kind of warning that he gives that we remember whose we are and who we are and where we're going. In 317, begin reading. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. <clears throat> For there are many who walk of whom I've told you often and now I tell you weeping. This is sad. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Polite, uh, they used to call it, um, what's that word my father used to use for hell? Well, I don't know why that escapes me. Their God is their belly, their appetite. They glory in their shame because they've set their mind on earthly things. Peter says, set your hope perfectly on the grace that will be brought unto you at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Hope, and not only hope at the end of your rope, hope with desire, hope with expectation, and as a girlfriend I had from Tennessee when I was in school say, hope how soon. I'd never heard that phrase before. Are you hoping how soon the Lord will come? You know that 
In the Bible, in Genesis, the third chapter, it tells the first words quoted from man, I was afraid and hid myself. I was naked and I hid myself. And the last words quoted from man in Revelation 22, even so come Lord Jesus. Now that represents the big change from the guilty or running from God to the saved or hoping for God to come. That's great. Have you ever been converted? Are you really believing the Lord Jesus? Do you walk by faith, working through love? Are you trying to keep a few rules and laws that will never save? They work only condemnation. Or are you trying to live in Jesus, for Jesus, by the power of Jesus, and let him be delighted in you when he comes? I think I'll quit the other six pages of the notes. I don't need You don't need those. <laughs> God bless you all. If I never see you again here, either.